Welcome to the ISF Podcast from the Information Security Forum. The ISF Podcast is hosted by ISF CEO Steve Durbin, and every episode he brings listeners features timely conversations, practical insights, and resources for global cybersecurity professionals. I'm producer Tavia Gilbert. October is Cyber Awareness Month, so we're marking the occasion with a series of three episodes that feature Steve in conversation with Dan Norman, ISF's Regional Director for Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. Today, Steve and Dan discuss the importance of cyber resilience and how organizations can prepare for cyber attacks. In this session, we are going to be talking about the significance of cyber resilience and essentially preparedness for organizations facing a variety of high-impact cyber attacks. There's a lot of news out there. It seems weekly there's a high-profile incident, and we're seeing that response and mitigation strategies are obviously a crucial part of that. But I'd like to start sort of wide here, Steve, with, in your opinion, what is the actual significance of cyber resilience and, more specifically, incident preparedness for 2023? Yeah, I think what we've seen is this sort of realisation in the industry that actually you can only do so much to make yourself look unattractive, if I could put it that way, from a cyber uh, attack standpoint. And if somebody really is intent on attacking you for a whole variety of different reasons, then you will suffer some form of incident. So the smart thing to do is to prepare for that day to figure out how you're going to respond, how you're going to ensure that you can protect your critical data, get your systems back up and running, and then we move into all of the things that may be required as well under regulation, because of course there are starting to come in uh, quite a number of different regulations, laws that are around these particular things, particularly if you're in critical infrastructure, financial services, we've seen that for a little while now. So I think that It's about a practical response to the fact that you can't always prevent an incident happening. So if you can't do that, what are the things that you have to do in order to protect your organization as best as possible, get it back up and running as quickly as possible, maintain the lines of communication with your stakeholders, they could be employees, they could be customers, uh, they could be regulators. And that's really, I think, where we've transitioned to, certainly in 2023, and I would expect us to be continuing down that road in 2024 and beyond. You mentioned there the different kind of stakeholders involved Mm. in wider cyber resilience and incident preparedness. In your opinion, though, what role does the C-suite have to play in incident preparedness and specifically the response? I think they are critical fundamental. If I look at incidents, if I look at the way in which member organizations and indeed other organizations outside of the ISF have prepared for incidents, the ones that have emerged in the best shape have been those where the message has come from the very top, from the board of directors, right the way down through the organization about the need to prepare for the day you hope never comes. Where we've seen organizations struggle a little more, there hasn't been that level of commitment. So why is that? It isn't just that the chief executive says this is what must happen. It's about understanding, I think, at the highest level in the organization, the impact that an attack or an incident can have on your ability to continue transacting business. So very often when people talk about cyber incidents, they focus on the incident itself. You know, how do I get my systems back up and running? Anybody who's been through this kind of thing will tell you that that, to a certain extent, is just the tip of the iceberg, because then you have to go into all of the recovery phase to make sure that the data you've got, the integrity hasn't been corrupted, that you can still access it, that systems, perhaps, that were attacked may need to be completely changed. We've seen some of that, certainly with with large-scale incidents, where there's been a complete wipeout of systems. They've all had to be replaced. So when we talk about the incident, I think it's important for us to look at it from a very broad perspective. And all of those things are board-level issues because they impact the way in which the organization is able to continue functioning. 
If it's a public company, it will probably impact stock price. Stock price will drop. But how you manage your way through that determines the success of your organization coming out the other end of it. Um, and so those are just some of the reasons why you have to have this very high-level buy-in, if you can get it, of course. Not everybody manages to do that. And uh, I think we will increasingly, though, see more and more boards of directors asking to understand better how they can help, what is their role in cyber incident response. Yeah, absolutely. I think what we're seeing on the ground when we're working with and, and discussing with CISOs and, and organisations in the membership specifically, our boards really do care mm -hmm. and they are really interested in testing their response and understanding cyber risk and the implications on the organisation but also themselves. Mm. Because... You've mentioned that sort of financial, operational damage that can manifest, but there's reputations on the line as well, yeah, these absolutely. types of things. So yeah. I think we both agree that the boards are easier to get on board when it comes to, say, running a cyber exercise or improving resilience. But how can an organisation prepare, say, senior management that have little perceived responsibility for security to manage a major cyber attack? Yeah, I think this is where the work needs to come in beforehand from the security standpoint. I, I think if you're in a, a, a sort of somewhat luxurious position from a business leader standpoint of not being impacted in any way, shape or form by a cyber incident, you're probably in the minority. So the onus, I suppose, is on the security department, the CISO in particular, to try to draw out what impact an incident might have on different parts of the business and explain the knock-on effect of that to the business leader, senior management, so that you get their buy-in. Now, that can be helped, of course, if you do have somebody at the board level or the chief executive who is already on board with it. If you don't have that, it becomes a little bit more complicated, and you do need to spend very much more time actually digging into this what-if type scenario. Ultimately, of course, what you're trying to do is to get these individuals to participate in, in what I would see as being an appropriate exercise that tests their readiness, but also demonstrates to them where perhaps some of the shortfalls are and what the impact of that is going to be on the business. Where we've done these things and we've achieved that, that light bulbs do go on and suddenly what you get is this huge enthusiasm for fixing the problem. But it was a problem they didn't realise they had. And so the role of security is really to shine a light on it, show a way in which it can be addressed and then look to gain the commitment to follow through. It's an interesting perspective. And I mean, you and I sat down a couple of years ago and spoke about the importance of, of playbooks, mm -hmm. business continuity plans. Yeah. And I've definitely seen an uptick of organisations writing those response plans. But where we are now is how can you provide meaningful assurance that senior management are actually prepared for the major incident? Because just because we have a playbook doesn't necessarily mean that we're ready. So what, what are your thoughts on providing assurance? I think you have to take them through the exercise. So you have to run a cyber exercise. You have to get them into a room where actually they probably don't have access to their playbooks because that's what's going to happen in reality. Nobody walks around with a playbook under their arm every day of the week waiting for an incident to happen. So we have to simulate that. And as you know, we, we've done a tremendous number of those this year, 2023, all around the world with ISF members and indeed non-members. And I think the next stage on from that, for me anyway, is to then provide some form of, of measurement and scoring back to the organisation that says, actually, when we compare you with your peer group, and we can do this, of course, within the ISF because we have a whole range of, of organisations all, all around the world, when we compare you with your peer group, this is how you stack up in terms of your ability to respond. And these are the areas where you need to spend a little bit more time. These are the areas where you shouldn't be complacent, but where you've got it under control. So I think it's migration from first step awareness that there is an issue in terms of senior management needing to be involved. Secondly, get them in to run a simulation. Thirdly, measure their effectiveness responding to that simulated exercise and then benchmark that against peer group as well. Because back to the point about boards, boards love to understand how they're comparing with other organisations. And again, at the ISF, we can do that. I want to unpack that measurement 
piece that you, you mentioned there because I haven't seen that in practice anywhere else mm. in the industry so far. We always get the question is how are we baselining either against the framework and how are we comparing against organisations? So how do you recommend measuring the readiness of the organisation to manage a cyber incident away from all the traditional assurance activities you have, pen testing and things like that. Mm. What are your thoughts there around the measurement piece? I think that from an ISF standpoint, we're somewhat fortunate in that we have had a benchmark service for very, very many years. And members have made use of that. We conduct engagements on behalf of members. And so we understand the whole essence of benchmarking. And indeed, there are a number of organizations out there that take our tools and, and white label them, as we know. So uh, we're not short of information, data, insight in this particular space. So it's a short step, as far as I'm concerned, from our traditional benchmark into then looking at how we can do peer class analysis and comparison across the number of different exercises and simulations that we've been running to provide at least a discussion point. I mean, some people may disagree with what we come up with. People disagree with benchmarks every day, don't they? But at least what we're saying is, in our experience, based on the work that we've been doing, based on other members' experience, peer group experience, this is where you are now in terms of your ability to respond to this kind of incident. And the good news is you now understand where that is. You may be happy with it. You may say, you know, the chances of us having an incident are so small that knowing that we've got that level of resilience in the enterprise, that's good enough for us. Others may say that isn't good enough. We need to do more work in that space. And again, we can help people to increase the different levels of uh, preparedness. Others may say, OK, that's a really good measure. I spent a lot of time this year on awareness and education, and I can see that now coming through in terms of the way that we're able to respond. So it isn't about using measurement as a, a sort of stick to beat people about the head with. It's about saying, let's take a very realistic approach to how we can assess our abilities as an organization, how we compare to other organizations, and then we can make a decision based on our risk profile as to what we want to do next. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I think what we see during an, an exercise or during a, a major incident is it's a multidimensional challenge. Yeah. There's internal communication, external communication to the regulator, to law enforcement. There's a bunch of domains within the organisation that have to be involved, mm -hmm. from the communications team, to security, risk yep. management, incident response. So I guess it's about having all of those teams on the same page and flexible enough to be able to act resiliently. My final question here is, where do organisations start if they have never done an exercise before? Um, are there any recommendations that you have in the short to medium term to embark on that journey? Yeah, I think, you know, you made the point earlier on that the level of awareness of the fact that incidents happen on an ongoing basis now is much higher than it ever was before. So I, I would be surprised if any organisation wasn't at least aware that there was a chance of, of an incident taking place. And very often it is about knowing how to take that first step. I think that from what I've seen, members of the ISF do talk a tremendous amount amongst themselves. So there's no shortage of experience that members can lean on. You know, so if somebody hasn't done one of these things before, there are other ISF members that have that they can talk to and they can do that at our events, at our chapters, at our World Congress, a whole variety of different mechanisms for doing that. They can also talk to our analysts or our consultants about what that first step might look like. And I think that when we've had those sorts of situations, what we then do is go back to basics and ask people what is it that they're actually trying to achieve and scope that out with them. Because it isn't something that you do once and then forget about. You know, these are ongoing, recurring exercises that you have to be running throughout the year. And I often say to people that they should really view it a bit like the audit. You know, you, you have no problem with your auditor coming in once a year. And indeed, they'll come in prior to that, partway through the year, just to make sure that things are going okay. And, and I think we have to get to a point where, with cyber simulations, we're doing such a thing. Because things are moving so fast. We've got staff turnover, we've got complexities of technology, we've got companies you know, expanding into different geographies. 
all sorts of things. And the risk landscape isn't slowing down either in terms of its evolution. So regular simulations, but the first step really is to talk to people who've been there and done it before. Yeah, I think that's a fantastic answer. I suppose it's a multi-dimensional challenge and there's so many stakeholders involved, yeah. but it should be an ongoing assurance activity that complements other risk management approaches that organisations are taking. So once again, thank you so much for your time, Steve. Pleasure, Dan. Thanks to Dan and Steve for today's conversation. We'll be back next week with the second in our Cyber Awareness Month special series when we discuss the security workforce. In the meantime, if you would take 10 seconds to pull up this podcast on whatever device you're listening, give us a five-star rating and write a quick review, we'd be grateful. You can also listen to the ISF Analyst Insight podcast, which goes in-depth on the hottest topics in information security. In every episode, ISF analysts hand-select active security professionals from ISF member organizations to discuss how the implementation of ISF research is uniquely applied to their real-world context. We hope you'll listen, and of course, we'll put a link to that show in our show notes. If there's a topic or question that you'd like us to cover in a future episode, let us know at securityforum.org, which is also where you can find our catalog of past video and podcast episodes, as well as ISF's research, practical tools, and guidance related to discussions like today's. The ISF podcast is produced by TalkBox and Tavia Gilbert, with senior producer Katie Flood, mix and master by Kayla Elrod, music by Alexander Filipiak. Thanks for listening. 